All right, uh, welcome to week two, everyone. Um, today we're going to cover uh, terminology and more of it, since you know that's pretty much what the first two weeks of my version of CSTD 215 looks like. Um, I'm going to go over details, some of what we covered really quickly last week, and then I'm going to go into more detail for the diagramming, so that you know I think Cheryl is supposed to go over it with you guys quickly and I just don't know how much detail she gave you guys so I'm going to give you my version of the same stuff but with more detail. All right now a lot of people that would teach database tend to start with talking about entities versus attributes. Uh, they usually start with entities before they even talk about attributes. I tend to go the other way around. Um, <coughs> why? I don't know it's just how I do it. Um, do I have a rhyme or a reason? There's a bit of logic later on. You'll see how I chose to do it. <laughs> Somebody's got to take the walk of shame. So attributes are also known as fields. So when you're talking about the logical design versus the physical design, attributes and fields are the same thing. Um, an attribute's a property or characteristic of an entity or of a relationship type. Relationship type's the same thing as an entity. It's just database guys can't seem to make up their minds what they want to call stuff. So we end up using the same term for many different things. Um, however, when we're dealing with attributes, there's a couple different classifications we've got to deal with. Uh, one is required versus optional. Um, required means when you're creating the data or inserting data into this entity, the data must be there. Optional means you know it's not necessarily mandatory. For example, when they're creating a student profile for you guys at the school, your date of birth and your name are mandatory, but maybe a fax number is optional. That's the difference between mandatory and optional. Mandatory it has to be there for the entity to be correct and true. And if it's not there, then it's optional, hopefully, and therefore it's not required for the entity to be complete. It just means it's nice extra stuff to have. Um, simple versus composite, and I actually go over these in detail in the next couple of slides. Uh, Single-valued versus multi-valued, these are all different kinds of definitions and I'll be covering that, that definitely in detail. Uh, stored versus derived attributes and then add an identifier attributes. So those are the different kinds of attributes you find. Um, like I said, in just a few slides I'll be going over all this stuff. However, when we're talking about databases at the conceptual level or the logical level, depending which word you want to use, there's three things that we have to play with. There's entities. All right, so an entity and an entity type is essentially the same thing. So depending on which book you read or which instructor teaches you, I tend to show you both words because you probably will come across at some point in your careers. Um, an entity and an entity type is essentially the same thing. An entity instance is a particular person, place, or object, or event that has attributes. So for example, they're going to come around to the front door so they can take a walk of shame in front of everyone for being late. You're worse than my wife. I will start without you. So, an entity instance, like I said, it's a person, a place, thing. For example, an entity type would be a student. It's a type of thing, right? An entity instance would be each of you are an instance of a student. You each have unique data that applies only to you, and you all have the same set of data, but the values inside that set are different person by person. So the different sets of data is known as an instance. When you start talking about later down when we're querying, an instance is the same thing as a row of data. It's essentially a collection of attributes that all belong together for one entity. Relationships. Now, a relationship instance versus the relationship type. 
the relationship type is the connection between two entities. So professor to student, that's a relationship type. The relationship instance, on the other hand, is Dan and whatever your name is. So I'm an instance of a prof. Each of you are an instance of a student. The relationship instance is this, the particular connection between two instances of data. So in other words, I'm an instance of a prof. You guys are each an instance of a student. The relationship instance would be the connection from me to you personally, to me to you personally, and me to you personally. That is the instance. There are many instances. It just happens to be the mapping between the different objects and how they're connected data-wise, not concept-wise. And then the attributes. The attributes are the properties, characteristics of an entity relationship type. We spoke about this quickly last week. Um, I'm obviously going to be going into more detail this week. Um, however, your name, your date of birth, those are attributes. All right, so to define the entity a little bit better, um, well actually, I, re I really need to get rid of this slide because I cover it in the first one because I keep forgetting the sli this slide's next. But quick review, an entity is a person or a place. An instance is each of you. The entity type is a collection of you. That's the quick and, the quick and dirty definition. So if you're looking for a definition, so if you know, a test shows up to the party and there's a question about, I don't know, what is an entity type? That's probably the definition you want to go with versus an entity instance or an entity itself. Now, I think I had this slide on last week or very, some, very, something very similar. An entity. An entity should be an object that it will have many instances in the database. In other words, you don't model an entity for one thing and only one thing. And by that I mean, for example, instead of creating an entity that was generic, it would contain many students in it. I create an entity for each of you individually so that I could represent you more uniquely and not be a, just a number, which really is all you are, is a number in the system. But as far as computer systems are concerned, however, you should not model something that only happens once and only once. It's just bad design. An object that should be composed of multiple attributes. Again, if you are modeling something that is so one-dimensional that it only has one attribute, other there's, there is a special case for this, for this one thing. When I talk about it when I start doing the physical modeling later. But most things you will model are not one-dimensional. They don't have only one thing that defines them. And then it should also be an object that we're trying to model. In other words, it sound, that sounds like a bit of a disingenuous statement. But an object that we're trying to model means it should represent something. So if I'm trying to model a student, it should represent a student. It shouldn't just represent you know, a person with, you know, just a person as opposed to there are certain things that are specific students as opposed to professors or, you know, front office staff or, you know, the guy driving his wrapped car that just drove down the street. You don't see a Natasha driving by very often. If you don't know what that is, be thankful. What it should not be is a user of the database. By that I mean you can model users. Yes. You shouldn't have an entity that is for one user. I'm back to that whole, you know, many instances bit. You shouldn't model so that when somebody logs in, it actually accesses one table just for them. And all that's in that table is them and nothing else. That's kind of bad design. And it should not be an output of the database system. So what is an output? An output's a report. You're not going to design a table to contain the data for a single report. That's what I teach you guys SQL for later. If you start creating a table for each report, you're going to have a bunch of tables that you have to constantly maintain and keep the data up to date in it. As opposed, you could use a different database object to achieve that same goal without creating CRUD in your database. So you should never be an output of the database system and it should never be the user that's sitting at the keyboard. You shouldn't model that user, you should model users in general. All right, now I can start talking about my attributes again. 
All right. Simple versus composite attributes. All right. So a simple attribute is fairly easy to understand. Your date of birth. It's only really made out of one piece of data. Your date of birth. Your first name or your last name. And I know, depending on your culture, your last name might be really complicated. And your first name might be really complicated. But generally speaking, there's a first name and a last name. Another thing that could be a single piece of information, your phone number or your cell phone number. That is a concrete, unique piece of information, self-contained. It's not made up of multiple pieces. A composite attribute, on the other hand, is like an address. And of course, I've got the answer here on the screen, but when you think about an address, and you just say, OK, what is an address made out of? And you'll automatically start thinking, well, there's a street address, there's a city, a province or a state, you know, a postal code, a zip code, whatever you want to call it, a country, maybe a post office box. But when I say the word address, you think automatically, and the human brain says, oh, he's talking about an address. We're talking about all these pieces. So, for example, how many of you have called somewhere where they asked you, say, in the last month, confirm your address? I've done it, right? And you call, like, can you give me your address? And you just automatically rhyme off, you know, 123 Sum Street, Auto, Ontario, K1Z, 1Z1. Without even thinking, you just go and do it. You don't usually tend to wait for them to prompt you for every piece of information because your brain says an address is a piece of information. And at the conceptual level, it is a piece of information. It's just known as a composite attribute. It's an attribute that's made up of multiple pieces. When we go from the, th the logical slash conceptual to the physical, each of those, each piece of the composite attribute will be broken out into its own attributes. So in their own fields. You don't have an address field. You'll have a street one, a street two, city, province, postal code. You will break it down to its component pieces. At the conceptual level, an address is an address. Who cares what makes up for it? And sometimes it's easier that way because depending on where you are in the world, addresses get a little complicated. Anybody here ever see how weird British addresses are? No? I've had a few British students over the years, and every time I say that, they start giggling. Because they have two city lines in some parts of England, but not all of it. They'll have like Worcestershire near Wilthashire something or other. And it's literally, they got this near another town. And that's actually the name of the town that for routing purposes. Other places, the postal code gets complicated. Uh, in other places, the street address is weird. Um, I know our German office doesn't actually have a street address. It's this building in this center in this city. What street is that on? Nobody cares. There's a post office box. And then the postman magically knows he's got to go to the third floor of the fifth building in this complex. Addresses are complicated. So when you're at the conceptual level, it's good to just call it an address and leave it at that. All right. Now, the next categories are the multi-valued and the derived. Now, multi-valued is the one that most people have a hard time understanding. It's a field that contains multiple values at once, at least at the conceptual level. So if I go and say, what are your skills? And you can think of hopefully you have more than one, right? So what are your skills? And you'll go, well, OK, I can one shot someone clear across the map with a knife on COD. You know? My APM is through the roof, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'm, I'm making fun of the gamers here. But notwithstanding that, you know, those are skills. And when you start listing off your skills, a lot of people will visualize it in their brain as a common delimited list, right? When you ask me, what, Dan, what are your skills? PHP, database design, Postgres, MySQL, Apache, Linux, Python, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give off a whole list of stuff. And by rhyme it off, you can almost visualize me putting a comma between them, right, as I'm going. That's called a multi-valued attribute. So when, at the conceptual level, it's multi-valued, and it can contain multiple values, but the number of values changes person by person. Some of you will say, well, what are your skills? I'm awesome at Photoshop. I can put a chihuahua head on a shark, and it looks almost real. 
And another person say, can say, well, I'm really good at skateboarding. You know, I can do whatever trick and I'm missing most of the skin on my knees and elbows to prove it. That kind of stuff. They got their list of skills and some person may have more skills than the other. Thus, it's a multi-valued attribute. Later on, when you leave the multi-valued attribute, what happens is this field will get ripped apart and shoved in as a separate entity of its own with a parent-child relationship. The parent being, say, the person and the skills being the child. However, at the conceptual level, it's just a list that's common delimited. Anytime you look at a value and it can be a common delimited list, it's, that's known as a multi-valued attribute. Derived attribute. This is the tricky one. A lot of people have a hard time with that one too. But in their case, because they don't understand when they need to use it. It's not that they don't understand what it is, they just don't understand when they need to do it. So, I'm going to list off a few attributes that apply to everybody. First name, last name, date of birth, height, age. Anyone want to take a guess which one in there is derived? And which one you never need to store? The age. Why? Because the age is now minus your date of birth. That will tell you exactly how long you've been on this planet. That is a derived attribute. If you can do math to figure out the answer, based on all the information you've got, that's a derived attribute. Another common derived attribute that a lot of people don't quite, aren't used to seeing is, you go to the Walmart and you're buying your groceries. Okay, you just walked up with 24 cans of cat food. Bang on the belt it goes. And the cashier decides to be lazy and she doesn't decide to go 24, beep, beep, beep. She goes, one, two, it counts 24 and goes 24 at beep. Now you look at your receipt, they'll show, you know, fancy feast, 24 at 99 cents a can, grand total is whatever that would be, like 23, 23.72 or something, 22.76. And that line total is a derived attribute. How do you know it's a derived attribute? Price times quantity equals something. You store the price, you store the quantity, you don't need to store the total. Now this used to be really, really important back in the older days. When we talked about computers that had hard drives that were measured in the megabytes. I'm not talking the 100 megabytes in the megabytes. Nowadays when we have these, you know, 500 gig, terabyte, 2 terabyte drives, space means nothing. Unless, you got, unless you're downloading movie after movie and storing Blu-ray releases on your hard drive, space means nothing at all. And games, you know, oh, that's a game, oh, that's only 82 gigs. XCOM 2. You know, that used to be important because we used to have to li limit how much space we used. So we used to not store the derived attributes. Same thing when you look at a, pr a total price. Well, how do you calculate the total price of an order? You add all the line totals, that's your subtotal, times the taxes, as applicable, gives you your total. You don't need to store the subtotal, you don't need to store the total, you just need to store how much of each thing did you buy and well, how much is the tax. And with that you can calculate everything that goes down the side of an invoice, everything that goes down the side of a receipt. Why? Because it's calculated as it goes. Now, those are derived attributes. Like I said, a lot of people have a hard time understanding when they should use them. And the easy way to decide when or not, whether or not you should, you know, use them is you go, can I calculate this based on the data I know already? It's a bit like deductive reasoning in math class. Can I solve this problem with the information I've been given? And I don't know if you've ever had one of those math professors that decides to leave something out to see how many people realize there's something missing. That was my grade 12 math teacher. He loved doing that to all of us. At least once a week we had one of those kinds of problems where we couldn't answer it because he didn't give us the whole story on purpose. Database design is very similar to that. You've got to look at all the evidence you've got. And if you've got all the pieces, congratulations, you can use derived. Now, at the conceptual level and at the logical level, which is the first, you know, first round of design, you identify the derived attributes. You put them on the diagram. It's good. It's a good place to have them. When you go to the physical, you, uh, you may or may not bring them across. 
Now, there's a reason to bring them across, which is performance. If you're a little guy sitting at the mall selling t-shirts and you sell a shirt every hour, you're fine using derived attributes. If you're Amazon, on the other hand, where you have more volume every tenth of a second than the guy at the mall has every, once every week, you're going to store the calculations with every line. Why? You don't have to calculate every single time somebody goes, look at my orders, oh, let's look at this order, and then it shows you all the totals. They'll store everything, all the derived attributes, they'll store them so that when it does that call, it does need to do the math. And how many people do you think every second look up at their orders on Amazon? How many of you actually, the second I said Amazon, went to Amazon? I'd to be surprised. I've actually had somebody who admitted that as I was talking about Amazon, they went shopping. Couldn't help themselves. They love shopping on Amazon. That is multi-valued versus derived attributes. Okay. Identifiers. Now I go into a bit more detail later. Um, identifiers. An identifier is also known as a key. It's an attribute or a combination of attributes that uniquely identifies individual instances of an entity type. That's a big mouthful. However, we can simplify that statement as in, when you look at the data, which attribute allows you to find a particular instance. For example, in this room, I could ask for your student number. Student number 4000, whatever the heck it is. You know, after everybody takes the time to look at their student card, because you may not know your number by heart yet, you'll go, oh, that's me. Because I was able to pick you out. That's your identifier. That's an identifier. There are simple and composite identifiers. A simple identifier is a single field that does the job, student number, or as the federal government is concerned, your SIN number, that kind of stuff. A composite identifier is an identifier made up of more than one piece. So I think it was with you guys last week, that's probably when I have two lectures, notice I forget what I said to each group. If we are looking to try to figure out how to uniquely identify a student, we could actually not use your student number, we could go, well, what's your SID number plus your last name plus another piece of information and put those three together, the odds are that'll be unique. And I hate that phrase, odds are. Because Murphy's Law would state, within a week, it's going to get broken. And a composite identifier is an identifier made up of multiple pieces. And the last one is the candidate identifiers. So when we're doing the initial design and we're trying to decide, well, okay, what piece of information can we use to uniquely identify the data in this database or this particular table? How do we identify each of these instances? You'll go through the list and you'll look at these potentials. And then once again, when I talk about students, that could be your SIN number or your passport number or your student visa number. The problem is that none of you all necessarily have all of those. So when you got three, and each of these could be used, those are candidates. And when you finish doing your design, you, f you eventually elect one of those candidate keys, maybe, to become your identifier, your primary key. So the candidates are basically, imagine it's a political event, people are getting voted on, eventually one of them wins, and they become the primary key, sort of like a prime minister, However, every once in a while, you decide that all the candidates suck and you vote for none of them. And I get to that, what you do in that case in a bit. Okay. I already covered the composite key. It's a key that's made up more than one piece. Uh, candidate keys are ones that uniquely identify each row in a relation. They're not guaranteed until you've come to the point where you know for a fact the primary key is the candidate key that is chosen as the key to actually be used by the database to uniquely identify each row. That's what I just finished talking about, worded differently. Um, some people wonder why I have the same slide twice, but they're not quite. It's different wording that says the same thing, and sometimes you need a different wording. But essentially, the primary key is the important one. 
the primary key rules the table. Whatever that is, what you use to uniquely identify anything in the database, whether it's a single field or a simple primary key, or it's a composite key. <coughs> the primary key rules. Now, that haven't been said. At some point I have my slideshow animated and it irritates me now because I just want to bring the whole slide up. A surrogate key. Surrogate key has another word that describes it. Actually when it gets to the point of doing physical design, I also introduce this, I talk about this also in detail, in much more detail than this. However, a surrogate key is also known as a synthetic key. As with every other technical terminal, every other environment job as things advance, terminology changes over the years. For the longest time, there was a concept called a surrogate key. Somewhere in the last five years, the, for the term synthetic key has started floating to the top. They're the same thing. So if you go on the internet and you see synthetic key as opposed to surrogate key, it's the exact same thing. Now, what is a surrogate key? A surrogate key is a, is a column that has a unique value that is generated by the database server. So instead of saying, what is your SIN number, and we're going to use that as your unique identifier, or what is your SSN, or your whatever the heck it's called, you know, anywhere else in the world, instead of using that, the database server, you have a column, and it has a value, and the value that goes into it is automatically assigned. It's a bit like, you know when you go down to the, to the financial aid office and you take a number? beep and it gives you a number. Nobody gets the same number twice, hopefully. You all get your own number as you go. Or go into the passport office, you know, you grab a, num they, you grab a number off the wall as you go through. Um, that is an example of a surrogate key. You're given a number temporarily so that you're easy to find in the group of people. Now, the unique values of surrogate key are assigned by the database server each time a row is added and the value can never change. That means that when a, a row gets created and you decided to use a surrogate key, a value goes into the identifier column, whatever you decide to call it. And whatever value you put in that, you're, you can't change. And surrogate keys are short, normally numeric. They're short and they never change, usually. And one of, the pro one of the things about it is once you've gone past a value, you can never go back to it. Anybody here ever use a lap counter? You know, lap, click, 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 click every time somebody goes by or you watch those people sitting on the side of the road counting cars that are going by? What a fun summer job that's got to be. Click, 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 click. That is how these work. The databases, depending on the server, they all implement it a little differently. <clears throat> but they all use the concept of a clicker. They count values. So let's say you add rows from 1 to 100, and then you add another set of rows from 200 to 500, and then you delete 1 to 100. You can never reuse 1 to 100. Those, those values have been used. Even if they've been discarded, they're gone. Reusing those values are a bad idea, so most database servers don't let you go back in. Now some of us get clever, because we want to have hidden records and stuff, so you know, we'll start to click the ticker like a thousand so you can use the space in front of that for other stuff. That's also a bad plan, but, you know, you can do that. Which leads me to saying circuit keys are perfect to use as a primary key because it doesn't depend on anything that's external. SIN numbers can change. Passport numbers cha can, or can change. Visa numbers are nebulous. If you're, you know, if you're an exchange student and you end up having to renew your student visa every year, your number's going to change. Or at least to my understanding it does. The surrogate key is assigned by the database. And you're, oh, yeah, and everybody in this room has a surrogate key assigned to them. Anybody want to take a guess what your surrogate key is? Anyone? Your student number. Like I've had a case where I've had two students in the classroom that had one number apart. Literally, like one was like 5'5", five, five, and the other one was 5'6", because they registered literally one right after the other. And that's how it works. I've got a number assigned to me, too. That's my employee number. 
It's not as long as your student number, but it's you know still a fairly big number, and it's automatically assigned by the system. It goes click, next, next, next. Other examples you'll see for this are receipt numbers, invoice numbers, uh, that kind of stuff. Those are surrogate keys. Oh, shoot. Went too far. Foreign keys. Foreign keys is an attribute. Have you noticed it's all I've been talking about as attributes? Foreign keys are an attribute. However, it is a attribute that gets its value from the primary key somewhere else. So, for example, um, actually this one's really hard to do as an example. I had one ready to go and my brain said it doesn't make sense. Essentially, when you're looking at a, a table or an entity or whatever, you'll have a, a column and its purpose in life is to accept the values from another one. In other words, the values in that attribute cannot exist without the value in the primary key of another table. So that's the that's a foreign key. It gets its value from another table. It cannot exist without something else. So if you really want to basically go, you know, in a very gross example, then gross can be applied more than one way on this one. For example, your foreign key is half your DNA that you got from your mother. So your mother provided you with DNA. And just so happens that as a child, your primary, your, your DNA is actually, you know, half your parents, right? Half your father's, half your mother's. At least that's what they say it is. Therefore, you know, you have a compound primary key which is made out of the values from your mother and the values from your father kind of thing. That's a really terrible analogy, but it's the closest one I can explain to human understanding is the value, you cannot have DNA in your body unless you got it from your mother or your father. And that's the primary, that's the foreign key relationship. It's, once we start playing with the actual data in a couple of weeks, this will make more sense. But it's terminology time. Okay. Now, when we're talking about identifiers, there's some criteria when you're choosing your identifiers. Top two that are always important. Choose an identifier where the value is never going to change. Now, people say, well, you know, there's things that never change. My date of birth. Yeah, do you know how many other people get the same date of birth as you? And technically, if you want to talk, really talk about it, how many people are born in the almost the very exact same second as you around the world? You know? Maybe not in Canada. There's definitely other parts of the world where kids are coming out, you know, at a fairly high density. Um, therefore, a, like a date of birth is not a good example for an identifier where the, the value doesn't change because it does change. For example, they make a mistake. Normally it happens. Not so much nowadays, but even up to about 30 years ago, that you know your date and time of birth was. Oh, he was born at 11:59 p.m. January 6th. Oh no, sorry, we made a mistake. It was actually January 7th. Okay, how about people born on leap years? Those poor people born on 29th that only age one year every four. At least that's what they try to tell me, but that's not really how that works. Actually, a lot of what happens in a lot of those fields is they won't let you put in February 29th. You have to actually pick the 28th or the 1st as their birthday, even though that's not their real birthday. So that happens at that point. Their date of birth is changing depending on what the system limitations are. Yeah, another choice is you can't pick something that's going to be null. That is means that you cannot pick something that may be empty. For example, as a student, I could say, well, you have to use SID number as an identifier. And then we get a you know, a pile of students that come in that you know are coming in on a student visa and they don't have a SID number because they're not Canadian citizens. Therefore you don't have a SID number. Therefore it's going to be null. Therefore it's not a valid identifier. You should also avoid intelligent identifiers. In other words, there should be identifiers that don't contain locations 
or people that might change. Now, understand the concept of locations, not, you know, not using that. If you read through the textbook, which hopefully most of you have started doing by now, you've probably come across the whole video store bit when they're talking about that they were using an address as part of the identifier and then somebody moves and their address didn't change the system. Suddenly this person's in there twice to different addresses and somebody else moves into their old address. Now you got two people with the same address. Addresses are no good because they change. How many of you still live in the house that your parents lived at when you were born? Well, there's going to be some, but, you know, out of my group of 125 that I have on Thursdays, I had one in the whole group that still live in their mother's basement. And that was the house where they were born. Well, not born there, but, you know, they were born. So, you know, it's kind of cool when you think about it, but, you know, places change. Can't use that. People that might change, same thing. People's names change. That's common. Uh, or depending on where you come from in the world, you'll pick up an anglicized name when you come to Canada because we can't pronounce your name. And I feel bad for not pronouncing your names, but I'm really glad when you see just please call me Julia. Because I can't pronounce your name and I'm going to butcher it and feel bad the whole time and make you feel bad too. Names change. They're not a given. And, you know, people can change their name. In Canada, it costs 150 bucks to change your name legally. And then you still got to pay for your driver's license and everything else, but the actual name change is 150 bucks. And it takes like like two weeks. So then you got a new name. Instead of being Dan, I'm Dave. Why? I don't know, but I could. Names are not good. So in the end, you want to substitute new simple keys for long composite keys. That's the last thing. If you've got this really complicated SIN number plus date of birth plus last name plus something else, you know how hard it is to look something up and not make a mistake when you're typing? As opposed to, give me person number 55. <sighs> and it brings back to the same example I was doing last week where, you know, if you add a synthetic key on it, you end up with easier to find. All right. I'm going to talk about relationships for a bit. There actually is a break in here somewhere, and I think we're almost there. Relationships. Now, relationships are fairly easy to understand. You have a relationship between myself and you guys. Instructor, student. One instructor, many students. You guys have one database instructor. Fairly straightforward concept. However, there's three common, well, there's, there's only three types of relationships. And that's known as cardinality. The cardinality talks about the, how the relationship works out. The first one is one-to-one. -one. That means that it's in a relationship where there's exactly one matching entity instance and only one matching instance. So if I were going to say student to teacher to student relationships one-to-one, -one, it's not. That would mean that I would have to establish a brand new relationship and a brand new instance for every single student. So there's whatever number of students in here, 20, 31, I would get cloned 31 times. So you each have a private version of Dan following you around to help you through your database work. There are days I wish I could do that. But, you know, that's a one-to-one -one relationship. Very much unused nowadays. It's very uncommon. It was more popular back in the day where you had really big limitations on your database sizes. For example, there was a database system that was really popular called DBase. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard that phrase. Um, that is what I learned desktop database on, was DBase. DBase had a limit of 50 fields. Well, DBase 3 had a limit of 50 fields per table. If you needed more than 50 fields in a table, you created a second table, and you kept going, and then you did a one-to-one -one relationship. So as you wrote the data, you'd fill in one table, then fill in the second table with the match. It was a terrible way to work. That was the limitation. That's where one-to-one -one was most commonly used. Nowadays, one-to-one -one is mostly used for security reasons. You have a record with a person's name and address and phone number. And then you have another entity that is an extension of that person which contains other information such as their SIN number, maybe the last credit card they used, stuff that needs to be safe and secure. 
you can encrypt this, you can change the permissions, you can change who can access this one piece of the database. And if the person can't access it, then they get an error. That's pretty much the only legitimate use, now, use nowadays for one-to-one. -one. I'm going to skip one-to-many for a moment and go to many-to-many. Many-to-many is a mess. That means that many entities on one side are related to many, many entities on the other. And it's really, really bad. Um, eh? Yeah, it's just complicated. You end up with this zigzag pattern of... You know, you have a parent record that's the parent of a child record, this child's a parent of another record, and then this record actually happens to be the parent of another record up here, which ends up being the parent of the original parent. It's like a relationship in Kentucky. If you don't know what the reference that means, that means they're hillbillies, they're all related to each other. And what happens in that case is if you could write, delete one record, you could, and the cascading rules have been applied to the database, you can actually end up nuking half the data in the tables because it just goes back and forth, deleting the children one after another. And then after a while, you know, it'll jump back up to the top because one of the child is also a parent of another record. So you end up with this cascade effect where you end up wiping out almost an entire table. And how do I know this is possible? Because I've done it. I didn't do the many-to-many. -many, I inherited a many-to-many. -many. And I needed to clean out one value. How many values got deleted? 22,536. How do I know that number? It was burned into my brain that day. And I will never forget that number ever again. And that's also the day I learned how to do a hot live restore from a backup on a production environment. It just so happened I didn't realize the implications of how everything was related. And it, out of that whole table, I think maybe 25 rows were left. And these were rows that weren't related to anything else. It was terrible. Um, there is a way of resolving many and many properly. And that's using associative tables after the break I'll be showing you guys how to resolve this mess. One to many. One to many is the 99% usage rule. 99% of the time you can create a relationship, it's going to be one of these. And I'm talking about a statistical 99 out of 100, not you know, the theoretical 99%. In other words, every single time you go to create a relationship, there's 99 chances out of 100. It's going to be the winner. So that's the relationship where parent-child. And if you remember reading this in the textbook, I think this would be chapter 4, if I remember correctly, the example that's used in the textbook, although they do use the word daughters, it could be any child, is a mother can physically have many children. Each child can ever physically have one biological mother. So biologically, a woman can have many kids. Each kid can only ever have one mother. So that's one to many. So one mother, many kids. And on the opposite side, when you flip it, there's many kids, but each of those kids can only ever have one mother, mother at a time. It's the simplest explanation that seems to make the point across. And if we turn it around with this group, one database prof, many students, each of you only have one lecture prof, because Obviously, you have two database profs, one for lab, one for lecture. But you have one database lecturer, and I've got many lecture students. So one to many, and each of you is a, you know, you're of many to one. That's one to many, the most common used database relationship. It's all there is to it. OK. Now, there's the cardinality constraint. The cardinality constraint is the number of instances an entity that can or must be associated with each instance of another entity. Big definition. Not that hard a concept. Minimum cardinality. In other words, for example, I can have just been hired on as a brand new prof and I don't have any students yet because they haven't assigned me a section, but I'm still a prof. That means, for me, students are optional. On the other hand, when you've been assigned to a section and the section has a professor, in your case, it ends up being a mandatory relationship, student to prof, going the other way. So you must have a prof for the course, but a prof may not have a course. So that's that. And in a second, I actually show the little uh, the crow's feet to explain this. Um, 
In other words, if there must be a record that matches, back to the mother-daughter, mother-child thing. A mother can choose to have kids or not. Therefore, children are optional. Once that kid is born, though, they don't have a choice about who their mother is. Therefore, the mother is mandatory as far as the child's concerned, on the biological level at least. So, child has a mandatory mother, mother can optionally have children. Now, maximum cardinality is something that's almost never used. But I mentioned it on the way by because there are a few database servers out there that actually enforce that if you choose to be there. It says, at most, how many can you have? Mother can have two children and only two children. That's a maximum cardinality. That is kind of, you know, not used because it's a great way to code yourself into a corner where your database system suddenly expands and suddenly you need to have a third kid. And that's life. So the important one is the minimum cardinality. The maximum cardinality is implemented in some places, but not all. But it's a terminology that you may come across in your careers. Now, these are your different symbols at the top. Mandatory one, optional one, mandatory many, optional many. When you start diagramming, you'll start seeing these. So for example, if we want to talk about the child and mother example again. As I said earlier, a mother can have many children. Each child has one mother. <coughs> children are optional. However, the mother is required. If you have an entity here, it must have a mother, but the mother can exist without the children. And obviously you can have the, the mandatory down here too. That's what the symbology means up there. So the optional one, optional many. Um, if nothing else, you really should memorize what these symbols look like. They are symbols that will crop up here and there in the term. Um, this is also the most common term uh, notation. It's known as crow's foot, uh, the one with the little three toes. Um, there's a couple of others out there that are picking up steam, but some people just don't know how to use them. There's UML. It's very popular and only half the people actually know how to use it properly. There's ID Fix, which is one that tried to gain popularity in the 70s and still gets taught in some universities in the States and it's slowly dying a miserable death. But it's been dying a miserable death for 30 years. Just won't let go. Um, odds are you'll end up with two notations, crow's foot or UML. Uh, when you guys learn system design, UML is something you'll learn, hopefully. And you can use either notations, they both work. But this one here visually makes more sense. It's quicker to understand than the UML one where you gotta read, you look at the symbol, then you look at each end, you look at the numbers at each end, then you resolve it in your brain. Whereas when you look at the crow's foot, you know it's many and you know the circle's optional. Okay, last one. Remember earlier I was talking about the many to many and how nasty that can be? An associative entity is the way you resolve it. Um, and actual fact, after the break, I'll actually go into more detail on how to use them. But there's two things that exist. There's something called an associative entity, and then there's one also as an, <coughs> it's a um, relationship with attributes. And it's a stupid phrase, relationship with attributes. Because realistically, what it is, is it's an associative entity that has extra attributes. But somewhere along the way, the database design theory guys decided to call it a relationship with attributes instead of an, an, an extended associative entity. Like instead of giving it a name that makes sense, they gave it a name that is just kind of, they decide this is words here and these are words there, we'll put them together and we'll decide that's what it's called. Now, 
An entity has attributes and relationships link entities together. That concept we've got so far. So an entity has attributes, student number, name, blah, blah, blah. Relationship links entities together, student to teacher. That we've got. When should a relationship with attributes be used instead of an associative entity? Now, an associative entity has two attributes and only two attributes. What are those two attributes? The primary keys of the many-to-many -many relationship. So you end up with this many-to-many -many relationship going like this and you don't want to do this. You actually want to separate them so that they're feeding down into a third entity. And in this entity, if it's a pure associative entity, has two attributes and only two attributes. The primary keys of the tables that feed into it. And that's all. On the other hand, when they talk about a relationship with attributes or an associative entity with attributes, it has the primary key from the feeder tables plus some other information. These could be dates or you know totals, that kind of stuff. Um, the ticket though that you have to remember is the associative entity is a recipient table. It's usually at the bottom of the chain. And it is on the many side of every, pretty much everything. So you got tables up here that feed it and it feeds into a many relationship at the bottom. When it's a, a relationship with attributes, it suddenly has meaning independent of the other, the other entities. So, for example, you got a mother, you got a father, they feed into a child. If it was a purely associative entity, the child could not exist without their parents. However, when this child associative entity has extra attributes, it starts having meaning outside of its parents. How many of you can exist without your parents right now, other than the fact that they might be feeding you? We all exist independent from our parents. Therefore, we're, we are actually what you call in a, a relationship with attributes or an associative entity with attributes. We are some of our parents' parts, however, we actually have other things that make us us. The associative entity has a unique identifier. Now, if you want to get particular, in our case it would be your DNA, or as a student it would be your student number. Um, an associative entity may participate in other relationships. It might be the child of three records. It might be a, actually might directly be a parent of another record. It, it could be anywhere. If it's a purely associative entity, that means it's a child of two other entities and only that. That's its only purpose in life is to be a child of the two. However, when it starts participating with the world in general, in other words, it starts receiving values from multiple places or it starts feeding values into something else, then it's an entity, it's an associative entity with attributes. And then I'm skipping the last one because we don't cover this anymore and I just forgot to update this slide. Now, okay, we're going to finish off this show and we'll see if we can get out of here a little earlier than last week. All right. Now, I covered a slide similar to this last week. Why would you use a NERD? This is the diagramming side. And documentation is important in computer land um, for a variety of reasons. One of the big reasons is it's called CYA documentation. In other words, you document everything. Don't write that down. CYA means cover your. <laughs> documentation lets you cover your assets to make sure you don't get in trouble. That's a, it's an acronym as you start working in the industry, you'll learn about real fast. Uh, because there's a lot of he said, she said in the industry. So when you're, especially when you work, not necessarily for the government, but if you work in private industry, we do consulting. The client says, well, I said this. And you said, well, no, you said this. And here's the documentation to prove that, yes, this is what you said. And you signed off on, on the fact that, yes, you did say this. So it's, documentation is good because it proves everything. If there's good documentation, everybody knows. So ERDs are the documentation tool for databases. There's, as we've been discussing, there's three kinds of models. There's three kinds of diagrams. An ERD stands for relation, uh, Entity Relationship Diagram. And it's either at the conceptual or logical side or at the physical side. Conceptual and logical look similar. They do the same job. 
the physical is more detailed. The ERD, on the other hand, the basic ERD, also known as the um, the, log, the conceptual logical, is abstract. In other words, it doesn't have any details. It, it's concepts. It explains the concepts. The goal of it is so that you can, with a minimum amount of explanation, by minimum, I'm talking like maybe 20 minutes, explain to them what they're looking at so they can understand the concept. So they explain to you a certain concept, you diagram it, you show it back to them with an explanation of what this, these symbols mean, and then they can look at it and go, that is what I was talking about, or no. It's a useful tool for the person that's going to create the data model. The data model is also known as the physical diagram. The data model is what actually gets built in the database. And if they're using an ERD to base themselves on, at least they're not going to forget anything. Sometimes they have to add stuff, but they won't forget all the important bits and pieces. Now, what is an ERD? An ERD is a conceptual data model, now that's a picture, that represents the data that's going to be used in an organization and how the things are interconnected. So, an example is, how would you diagram student to teacher? Do you explain that relationship using a picture? And in the end, it should be a graphical representation of the proposed database. In other words, this is how I propose that the bits and pieces are going to be stored, roughly like this. Does that make sense to you? And sometimes the other person at the other end thinks they know what you're saying and it doesn't work, but, you know, 50% of the time, it it's good. They'll roughly understand what you're talking about. And by 50% I'm being really generous. That's not always how it works, but, you know, 50% is actually a pretty good percentage if you can get it down to 50%. Now, the next slide has a ton of text on it. Okay. Now, one approach to identifying at entities. So when you start diagramming, the very first step is you want to identify the entities you're dealing with. And one of the approach is to work through the information and highlight the words that you think correspond to entities. In other words, you look through a blob of text or you're given a stack of forms or you know a data dump. And you start collecting information out of that. And out of that, and if you're lucky, you'll be given like a nice written summary, and you can sit there with your highlighter, go squeak, 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 and just start highlighting pieces. And the very first one you should do is you're going to highlight the things. You only highlight them once. So if you see this thing appear more than once, you don't highlight it a second time because you're going to confuse yourself. And if we look at this paragraph, I've already done the highlighting for you. A company has several departments. Okay, a company is a thing. We know that. Departments is a thing. Well, it's a concept, but it's a thing. Each department has a supervisor. Okay, that's another thing. And at least one employee. That's another thing. Employees must be assigned to at least one, but possibly more departments. Notice nothing's highlighted there because these are just repeated concepts. At least one employee is assigned to a project. Oh, there's something new. Highlight it. But an employee may be on vacation, not assigned to any projects. The important data fields, as identified by the management, is the name of the department, project supervised employees. In other words, everything has a name. And it just so happens to be that the supervisor has a number, the employee has a number, and the project has a number. So there's some numbers in here too. Now, if we're going to go back really old school. The first thing we want to do is start finding the relationship. So, so far we identified all the entities as far as the information they were given. And one of the really oldest methods of doing this, and this is how, literally how I learned it when I was in school. This has not changed. It's been 20 something years and it's still this way. This method worked back then and it works today. Is you do a, do a relationship matrix. Anybody here play sports? Did you ever participate in a round robin? And you know how you got the round robin team one, team one, team two, team two? And you write down the results and the middle row, the middle, the, the angle cells don't get any values because obviously you can't compete against yourself. But it's, look, this looks almost like a round robin uh, relationship chart. And so what happens next is as you go through the previous paragraph, you can look at how things are supposed to be connected. 
and you fill in this chart to go, go through each cell, decide if whether or not there's an association. So for example, first cell in the second row is used to indicate if there is a relationship between the entity employees and department. So department going across to employee, well, the department is assigned employees according to the paragraph and the department is run by a supervisor. There not once was department and project mentioned. Obviously the department can't be related to department. An employee belongs to the department and an employee works on a project. Supervisor runs a department, did you notice? The supervisor doesn't do anything else. And the project uses an employee. So that's the relationships that we were able to identify from that paragraph. We fill in this bin and it gives us, you know, how things are interconnected. In the end, we should be able to create a little set of sentences like this. A department is assigned to an employee. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to the department. An employee works on a project. Supervisor runs a department. A project uses an employee. When you're starting out, this kind of work sounds really redundant and boring, but it's a great way to make sure you understand how the data is interconnected. After you've done database design work for long enough, you tend to skip some of these steps. Just putting it out there, you know, after you've done it for 20 years, this happens automatically in your head. This step. Actually, even the chart sometimes happens automatically. But the chart's a great way to go to your, you know, client and say, is this how things are before I start, you know, drawing pictures? Does that make sense to you? And they'll say yes or no, and therefore you make amendments. And then you adjust your little sentences, and then you're ready to draw pictures. So you draw a rough ERD now. I believe Cheryl was supposed to give you guys a little demo on this. And if you watch the recording I posted from a previous lecture, I posted a link last week to like a two-hour lecture that did just this, a uh, different course. Um, it covers um, entities are in rectangles. Diamonds and lines are used to do the relationships. An employee works on a project. That's essentially how you diagram that. Now, if we were to take this and we can turn it into this. A department is run by a supervisor. A department is assigned an employee. An employee works on a project. In theory, you could put multiple entries inside that diamond saying, you know, a department is run by a supervisor. A supervisor runs a department if you really want to. But most of the time, you can figure it out roughly what they're talking about. This diagram is now what they'd call a very basic or rough ERD. In other words, it's an ERD that contains the entity and the relationships, but nothing else. No attributes, nothing else. So when somebody talks about a conceptual diagram, that's what they're talking about, is this. Depending on who you want to talk to next, they might argue that once you put attributes, it's no longer conceptual, it's now logical. Depending on who, you know, where you learned, the terminology changes. But this is a conceptual diagram. So the next step is you want to fill in the cardinality. So now we're going to put in our little crow's feet. So a supervisor, each department has one supervisor. Each supervisor has one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. An employee, each department must have at least one or more employees and each project must have one or more employees. However, when it comes to a project, an employee can have zero or more projects. And I don't know why my zero ended up being an O, but each project can have zero or more employees. In other words, a project can exist with no employees. An employee can exist without a project. Actually, let me phrase that. The project must have an employee, but an employee doesn't have to be assigned to a project. If they go on vacation, they're not going to work on a project. So which leads me to this. Here's our cardinality based on what we identified. Each department is run by one supervisor. A supervisor runs one department. Each department must be run by a supervisor, and each supervisor must have a department. Otherwise, they're not a depart they're not a supervisor. A department is assigned employees, one or more. Each employee is assigned to one or more departments. Each employee may work on a project or not, but they can have multiple people working on the project. And 
each employee can have multiple projects, which means you know multiple people can work on the same project, and the same person can work on multiple projects. This diagram shows an example of all the different cardinalities. So the next step is putting in the, the identifiers. Now, when we go back to the paragraph, and I'll go back really quick, down here at the bottom, you'll see a supervisor employee number and a unique project number. So each, each person has a number associated to them. So we can pretty much guess that these are the identifiers. So we can add them in. Now, the circles are attributes. We know about this. I don't want to trip. So we know we were given that the supervisor has a number, the employee has a number, the project has a number. However, we're not 100% sure what the department's got, but we can pretty much bet that there's a department name. And the odds of having two departments with the same name, pretty small. So we can probably guess that the department name is a unique identifier. So we added our primary keys, and now each of our entities have a primary key. So now we're well on our way to have an attributed conceptual diagram, which some people call a logical diagram because there's attributes on it. Now, the next step is to identify attributes. Now, in this step, we try to identify name all the attributes essential to the system that we're studying. But we're not necessarily going to try to match them up to the entities yet. So we go through the paragraph, try to identify all the bits and pieces that look like relevant information, collect it all up, make a list, maybe keep track of where you found it. But yeah, you just have a list of all the attributes. And then the best way to do this is to collect the forms and the files and the reports, everything else that they can provide you, all the information they can provide you so you can sit there with a highlighter and just start highlighting pieces of information. Then you can take that and break it apart. Um, you'll cross out anything that you think will not be transferred to the new system. Things like signatures or constant information that doesn't change such as the company's address, the corporate headquarters address or um, the name of the company. Those are things that don't change regularly. They do change, but not all that often. Whatever's left behind is what the attributes you need to re you now require. Um, then what you do is you've got your list of attributes and what you think the entities are. And you go check with your system users. And when I say that, I don't talk, I don't mean, you know, your You've been hired as a consultant at a firm, and they want you to re-implement their shipping system. And they give you all the paperwork, so you went through all the paperwork, and you think you've got it right. And then you go back to the client and say, okay, this is the stuff identified based on what you told me. Is there anything in here that I'm not supposed to take forward? Am I missing anything? So the person will look at it and go, man, well, that looks good. Do you know what you just did that was wrong? You didn't go talk to the person that works in shipping. The guy that actually does the job. Because you know what? He might realize that half that information is crap. It's all related to the old shipping system they used to have. It has nothing to do with the new system. And they might be able to identify some things that need to be brought in that weren't listed because, you know, the project manager doesn't know what the guy does in shipping. He doesn't know what he, how he folds the boxes and what he puts in the boxes and what he has to type into the FedEx console. He doesn't know this stuff. Well, he might know, but... The guy who's actually doing it probably knows better. Which leads you to um, why you should always go and do a final pass with the people actually that are actually going to be using it. That way you're not going to lose any information. So back to our paragraph. The only thing that they indicated to us were the names. Name of the department, the project supervisor, employee, and everybody had a unique number. And this next slide is really, really busy. There's a, they did one more thing on it, which I'll indicate in a second. But they also resolved the many-to-many -many relationships, which essentially means that they created an associative entity. So what you used to see was this. Once you're done attributing and resolving the many-to-many, -many, you have this. Now, it's really hard to read. If you download the PowerPoint, you'll be able to actually zoom in properly on your laptop. 
However, if you look at it, and I'm just going to turn this, I can, so it can follow me as I'm pointing. The supervisor has a name and a number. The employee has a name and a number. The project has a project number. We don't know anything else about it. The department has a name. Now, what's different right here is this entity and this entity just showed up to the party. These weren't here before. Before, what we had, we had the many-to-many -many thing, right? We're employee to project. So an employee could work on multiple projects. The projects could be worked on by multiple employees. And to resolve that, so you don't have this mismatch of records going across each other, you, end, you create a new entity. It's an associative entity. Now, this is using the really old Chen style notation where they don't have the diamond in the box. That diamond came along about 15 years ago. But often textbooks and slides on the internet will leave this look. Um, but it's still an associative entity. And you'll see in here the employee number and the project number. So the employee number, and the project number comes here. Same thing happens with employee department. The department name is in here and the employee number is in here. And that that is a um, associative entity. If I were to actually draw the diamonds in for you guys. And I suck because I'm going to draw using a mouse. That's our diamond. Oh, this one's fantastic. I did way better last time. That's good enough. That's supposed to be a diamond. <laughs> I can't draw with a mouse. It's really hard. But with the modern notation, those would be the diamond ones. And then when you're done, and you've got something that looks like this, you need to do one last step. You want to check your results. You look at your diagram from the point of view of a system user or owner. This, you play some role playing. In other words, you pretend to be the guy in shipping. You pretend to be the, you know, the, the data entry person. You pretend to be the sales clerk or the sales rep or the tech, or the tech support agent. <coughs> and you try to go through looking at it from their perspective. And then you look at the data and you go, does this make sense? Is this clear? Is this obvious? Then you check your cardinality pairs. And you want to make sure everything's good, that you know the relationships add up properly. And then at the end, you want to look over the list of attributes associated with each of the entity, make sure you didn't forget anything. Uh, you want to make sure you didn't put the same attribute in two different places. That happens sometimes where you have a leakage, where you were adding it here and you go, oh, no, no, actually, I should. And then you forget about it and you go, oh, I should have been here. And then you start adding it in more than one place. You want to make sure that the same data doesn't get represented multiple times. Um, and then what I usually recommend at that point is you take a break. Walk away from it for a day. You know, go walk the dog, go have a beer, you know, go take a nap, whatever works for you. Go waste away 12 hours of your life on Overwatch. Whatever applies to your personal taste. You know, go spend another $5,000 on Magic the Gathering. Who has money for drugs when you play Magic? And then you come back in and you look at it. And you, you, you'll, you might realize with a fresh pair of eyes that you forgot something important and you put it in. And at that point, you're pretty much ready to go physical, which is a lecture for another day. Um, but once you've achieved this point, you're pretty much ready to go. You're ready to go physical diagram. It works. Um, the ERD makes sense. You've got a properly attributed diagram. You got everything you need to cover for the customers. Should be good. Okay. Now. Like that. I'm just double checking what you guys need should be doing for homework. Okay, now, because if you're going to pay for those textbooks, you're going to read those textbooks.
Because you know what? There's nothing that irritates me more as, as a student. There's nothing that pissed me off more as a student when they made us buy a $200 textbook, or in your case, you know, a $70 textbook, and then you use five pages. Right? And I, like I said, I've read through this textbook, and I actually think it's a pretty good textbook. The, the wording's really good, and it's clear. It's fairly straightforward to understand. It actually has some really good information in it. So it's not actually a waste of money and time if you actually read it. Um, so what should you be reading this week? I have good news, though. You only have one chapter to read. Read chapter 5. Um, right now, you may have downloaded the labs document. Um, I've told, I've warned Cheryl of this. I update the lab document depending on what's happening. And I switched, so if you downloaded an old copy of it, make sure you download it every week. So that's my way of saying don't print yourself a full copy of it because it's a waste of your paper. Unless you're doing it here at the school and then, you know, if you get free printing, great. If you don't, well, that sucks. Because um, I just updated it last week, and then I realized I made a mistake. And, you know, I had to fix it. I've switched labs three and four around. So still do lab three this week. That's what you should be working on, because you guys did lab two last week, right? Right, you drew little pictures of Cheryl. Uh, lab three is learning how to use your diagramming software. In this case, you're using Toad. Um, I'm still waiting for the keys to come up. Everybody's ignoring me. Uh, I've just been swinging doors at my day job. Otherwise, I was trying to pick up the phone that actually called and get put on hold for a while to find out why none of the academic keys are coming through. Uh, it's causing confusion and panic amongst people, which kind of sucks. Um, however, it'll show you how to use Toad. It walks you through diagramming and that kind of stuff. and whether or not we end up still using Toad or not is relevant um, because the mechanicals are the same. So once you understand the concepts in one piece of software, the concepts are the same in the other one. Uh, so you guys should be working on Lab 3. Um, now, theoretically, you should be doing Hybrid 3. I'm saying you're not ready for hybrid three. Okay? So you're supposed to have one hour of hybrid a week. Do this. Okay, for your one hour of hybrid time, read chapter five. Pretend that's your hybrid. Um, Hybrid 3 requires next week's lecture. I'm still trying to normalize the two groups. As of today, I've got the two lecture groups synchronized now. Which is good, which means I'm doing the same lecture for both groups. Um, which means you're all doing the same work at the same time, which makes life easier for everybody. Um, I'm also going to post my, uh, my alternate lecture time even though you're not supposed to cross-populate from one lecture to the other. Uh, because my other lecture hall was overbooked at the moment, but in a few weeks, you know, if it, this night doesn't work for you, you could theoretically come and sneak in on Thursdays. Maybe. Just saying. Um, I don't want this room to be empty either. <laughs> That's not good either. Um, but, yeah, my other lecture is at 4 o'clock on Thursdays. So for some people that might work better, and some people it doesn't work. Um, Okay, well that takes care of that. Nobody's coming to my lecture from here. Congratulations. Uh, but if you decide to skip, Cheryl's got to come visit me. That's okay. But I'll still post where I am in the other things. I just got to wait for a little bit longer for the group to thin out a little bit so there's actually room for people to straggle in from other sections. Uh, that's the perk of having the two labs, the two lectures synchronized. Is you're, I'm now covering the same stuff at the same time for everybody. Um, last week's lecture was compressed. This week's lecture was not quite as compressed. And next week's lecture is the normal lecture. And if all goes well next week, it shouldn't take the whole two hours either. So that's good too. Um, but yes, take a break from the hybrid because you can't... The hybrid three, you're welcome to watch it. Go ahead and watch it. 
It's just not going to make a lot of sense to you. But hey, you're 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 welcome to watch it. Um, chapter five, though, please read. That's going to prep you for next week's lecture. Um, the reading, well, the reason I had you read two chapters last week was to catch up to the concepts we're covering in the first two weeks. It's not like I can tell you the week before start, class starts, go read chapter three. And then go read chapter four, you know, when you guys actually show up for the first lecture. That's, you can't assign homework before you come to class. Um, but now going forward, it's usually going to be about a chapter, maybe a chapter and a half, depending on how thick the chapters are. Chapter five for next week, lab three. And then that's that. So that's your assigned work for this week.